Thank you, David. So again, very briefly, this is meant to be an evolutionary study looking at the next version of the balloon expandable um, uh, sapien valve. And as, as I discussed, there are some differences in this valve. Uh, in terms of the leaflet geometry, in terms of the support frame, in terms of the delivery system, all of which summate into producing a much smaller device, a device which is close to about 40 percent smaller than the original device, which facilitates entry and potentially can have other beneficial effects that relate to vascular complications and even trauma to the native valve as you cross it. Um, so we're just beginning to learn about that device. As you know, that device is used clinically in pretty much every other um, uh, region in the world on a routine basis. This is the first time it's been studied in a rigorous randomized trial comparing it to the earlier predicate device. This was a 560 patient randomized trial. We have one year data, a total of 28 sites, um, all in the United States, all in the so-called inoperable or highest risk cohort of patients with severe symptomatic aortic stenosis. The key findings and takeaways were from a procedural standpoint, the device appeared to fulfill its expectation in that the procedure itself was a little bit shorter, anesthesia time was reduced. The need for a second valve, which is often related to the precision of being able to place the original valve, was significantly reduced. The number of aborted procedures, either due to the inability to advance the device through the vascular tree or to cross the valve, was reduced. Um, the um, need for hemodynamic support during the procedure was reduced, and the vascular complications, the important ones, were reduced by 40 percent, and some of those major vascular complications, like perforation or acute dissection, were reduced very substantially. The clinical endpoints, um, this was a non-inferiority trial, both at 30 days and one year, did not show any significant differences in the major endpoints, which were all-cause mortality, disabling stroke and repeat hospitalization, there was a trend towards a reduction of early all-cause mortality at 30 days from 5.1 to 3.5 percent, but that was not statistically significant. So the triple endpoint um, was non-inferior with a p-value of 0 .0034. Uh, the other area of importance was to see did we give up anything to try to have this lower profile device that appeared to improve the early procedural results from the standpoint of valve performance. And if you look at, a, at effective orifice area and you look at gradients, it appears to be about the same with both devices. There was a trend towards an increase in paravalvular and total aortic regurgitation with the new versus old device that has not been observed. It's never been compared. Uh, and this is a core laboratory assessment. We're still trying to understand a little bit more about the importance of that trend. I'll point out it's confounded a little bit by the fact that the older device, the Sapien device, required more second or third valves to treat usually paravalvular regurgitation. So there was a little bit of an offsetting associated with that that might have contributed to the difference between the two devices, but that needs to be looked at a little bit more critically. Um, so it's um, I think from the standpoint of the trial, it fulfilled its non-inferiority mandate and demonstrated, we think, some clinically meaningful secondary endpoints that would justify the preferred use of this device compared to what is the current commercial Sapien device that's being used in the U.S. Marty, thanks. Gary of PCT at ACC. Gary. Sure, David. Um, just, a, uh, just a couple of points. I mean, Marty presented the data elegantly. First, understand the patient population, inoperable AS. We learned from the first partner trial that these patients' uh, mortality is astoundingly high, and it's driven um, not, s not only by uh, the procedural issues, but the underlying disease states. The fact that by the time they have a procedure done, um, their um, survival is as much dictated by how, by, by their comorbidities as by anything else. And in fact, it's much higher than we ever thought um, and conventionally taught in, in, in the textbooks. So that's one thing. Um, the second is never underestimate the importance of bleeding complications. Um, these bleeding complications are hugely disabling, are associated with increased 
um, complications of all time, especially in this kind of old, frail um, patient population. And third, um, you know, I, I am not at all surprised by the data because this basically isn't a better, easier device to use, but it is still fundamentally correcting the problem of severe aortic stenosis. And if you look at the history, for example, the parallel history of surgical valves, you know, very few surgical valves change mortality compared to other surgical valves. These are just evolutionary technology that are easier to use, um, uh, have better hemodynamics and so on. So I think these results are, are, are you know, are superb. I mean, uh, especially for us in the United States where the rest of the world has this device used uh, routinely clinically and we have to go through the rigors of, um, of an FDA sanctioned trial in order to get access to something that the rest of the world has. Uh, and it's just, re in fact, just an iteration of something that we've been using for the last couple of years. So, I mean, put it in context of the patients, inoperable with unbelievable comor comorbidities, a device that um, is procedurally easier. And again, think in terms of the history of surgical valves, modern surgical valves, one versus the other, don't improve mortality. There just have to be improved hemodynamics and ease of use for the surgeon. Our next speaker is Dr. Mansour of CCT at ACC. Dave. Sure, David. Um, just, a, uh, just a couple of points. I mean, Marty presented the data elegantly. First, understand the patient population, inoperable AS. We learned from the first partner trial that these patients' uh, mortality is astoundingly high, and it's driven um, not, not only by uh, the procedural issues, but the underlying disease states. The fact that by the time they have a procedure done, um, their um, survival is as much dictated by how, by, by their comorbidities as by anything else. And in fact, it's much higher than we ever thought um, and conventionally taught in, in, in the textbooks. So that's one thing. Um, the second is never underestimate the importance of bleeding complications. Um, these bleeding complications are hugely disabling, are associated with increased um, complications of all time, especially in this kind of old, frail um, patient population. And third, um, you know, I, I am not at all surprised by the data because this basically isn't a better, easier device to use, but it is still fundamentally correcting the problem of severe aortic stenosis. And if you look at the history, for example, the parallel history of surgical valves, you know, very few surgical valves change mortality compared to other surgical valves. These are just evolutionary technology that are easier to use, um, uh, have better hemodynamics and so on. So I think these results are, are, are you know, are superb. I mean, uh, especially for us in the United States where the rest of the world has this device used uh, routinely clinically and we have to go through the rigors of, um, of an FDA sanctioned trial in order to get access to something that the rest of the world has. Uh, and it's just, re in fact, just an iteration of something that we've been using for the last couple of years. So, I mean, put it in context of the patients, inoperable with unbelievable comor comorbidities, a device that um, is procedurally easier. And again, think in terms of the history of surgical valves, modern surgical valves, one versus the other, don't improve mortality. There just have to be improved hemodynamics and ease of use for the surgeon. Our next speaker is Dr. Mansour.